Okay, so welcome back. Um, now we're going to move into discussing schizophrenia and the nursing process. So the first thing I wanted to do is to look at the different phases of this uh, schizophrenia intervention and identify some outcomes for each area. So the first is when they're acutely um, in crisis. So their um, symptoms have exacerbated um, and the safety of themselves or others is at risk. So at this point, um, we're looking to increase our supervision. Safety is always going to be number one uh, intervention at this point. So increasing that supervision, addressing their any paranoia, um, reducing stimuli so that they can uh, are less likely to misinterpret their environment, um, providing them some diversion, trying to de-escalate the situation. And depending on how severe the symptoms are for the patient, um, that may actually include uh, seclusion or physical restraining the person. Phase two is after you have dealt with that crisis, right? The person has been started on some medicine, um, their symptoms are not as severe, and they're going to be more open to you helping them uh, figure, understand the illness, understand the treatment, uh, understand the medications, and start working on some positive coping mechanisms or skills. Okay, the outcome um, target also phase two. Um, the outcomes also target the negative symptoms, so addressing their ability to succeed in society, in their job, or with their self care activities. And then phase three is maintenance of all of that, so maintaining them at a functional level. I'm waiting for my PowerPoint to advance for you. I think I'm a little delayed, so I'll start talking. The next slide was going to give you some assessment guidelines. So um, you want to be, when you're doing your assessment, doing your normal things, the things we talked about in, the, in our first learning plan about assessing um, mentally ill patients. So you're looking at any of their past medical history. You're asking them about um, drug and alcohol dependence. You're doing that suicide uh, at risk or a violence assessment on them. Are, are they thinking of hurting themselves or hurting others? Um, asking them if, about if they're having auditory hallucinations. Um, if the voice they're having is telling them to do anything, again, um, those command hallucinations can be telling them to do things that can be harmful to themselves or to others. And it can also be telling them to do things that are not harmful, but we need to determine what, what the voices are saying um, to that person. Um, again, we're going to be looking at delusions. Um, are they present or aren't they present? Um, Self-safety. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, any medications they're on? Doing a mental status exam on them. Um, trying to get the patient's perception of what's going on. Do they really think that they're ill? Do they think they have a problem? They may not. Um, and then we're going to be looking at the, the family dynamics that are involved also family dynamics and um, family knowledge of the disease, um, family functioning, is it dysfunctional or is it supportive, things like that, okay? Here is a list of nursing diagnoses. There are certainly many more, but these were the top seven that I thought related to schizophrenia, so you can just review this. So interventions, again, acute phase, what we're looking at is making sure that they're getting a psychiatric um, assessment, a medical review, and a neurologic review. Um, you, you know, we may think that they have schizophrenia, but there may be some other medical conditions or neurologic conditions that are causing the symptoms, and it may not be psychiatric. 
So oftentimes there's going to be a consult for each of these disciplines to do a full evaluation of your patient. Um, we're going to look at um, psychopharmacological treatments. Um, we're going to uh, support, educate, guide the individual. We're going to be supervising, again, setting limits and providing that safe environment for the patient. And that final one, monitoring fluid intake, again, if we're putting somebody on an antipsychotic, the anticholinergic effects of those medications is going to cause that polydipsia. So you're going to have some fluid imbalances that could be going on. So we're monitoring that. During the stabilization and maintenance phases, again, you know, we're making sure that we establish that the person um, has a primary care provider so that we can um, maintain that medical management of the problem. Um, you know, we want to look at community-based therapies. Again, you know, these individuals have very much difficulty um, in society, in their jobs. So we're going to want to be looking at some resources for these individuals out in the community to help them maintain um, control over their illness. Again, if you remember from our first lecture under um, um, mental health concepts, there are things such as your PHC, which is your psych home health care, the a ACT, which was your assertive community treatment, and then NAMI, which you know we have our nice guest during our first class, um, which is an organization that can support the, the patient and the family. So other interventions, this may seem basic, but it is the basic stuff that is so important. So we're working on that effective communication, right? We are asking questions. Remember, we're asking open-ended questions. We want the uh, patient to be talking. We want to leave the door open so they can elaborate on some of our questions. Okay. We um, so you might ask something like, "What is going on right now?" And that opens the door for them to talk about maybe what's internally in their mind happening. Um, I want to re just remind you that with the delusions, we are not arguing or disagreeing with their fixed beliefs. Okay, As their relationship builds, we will then start to explore with the person um, what they see as, as evidence of if that belief is real or not real. Okay, So um, let the client know you're not hearing or seeing the things that they are. That's okay. I mean, I think it's okay for you to say to them, well, you know, you might see Joe over there and he's yelling at you, but I don't see Joe. But, I, and, but then you would follow up with something like, but I believe that you you are seeing Joe um, and try and help me understand um, why Joe is there something like that okay so try and help them determine what's real and what's not um, we're going to be giving medications again for the agitation or the acting out behavior um, and we're going to be doing some limit setting okay um, we're going to try and have our interactions with them be brief but frequent so that we don't overwhelm them or we, they don't get the impression that we are keeping them prisoner or um, other paranoid thoughts that they may have if we're constantly at their side. So let's move on to um, psychobiological interventions. Obviously that would be our medications. Um, medications are, again, are meant to treat symptoms. They are not meant to cure the disorder. That's not going to happen. Most of the medications are geared toward blocking dopamine, but some of the medications also um, can block dopamine and serotonin simultaneously. 
Um, so it, it, by giving the medications, it's helping the client be more involved in their therapy and perhaps some of their ADLs or self-care type of activities. These medications, as we've discussed multiple times, have many, many, many side effects, okay? And the other thing I want you to remember about antipsychotic medications is that their effectiveness usually is going to peak between three to six weeks in time. So you may not see an immediate result. So um, I do want you, I know in our first learning plan when we were talking about medications, um, I advised you to watch um, those videos on extra pyramidal side effects. Um, again, I think I posted them a second time in this learning plan so that you can review those. I can't stress how important it is that you understand those extra pyramidal side effects because the sooner that we can intervene with those, the better it is going to be for the patient and we won't get to the um, to the extreme of the tardive dyskinesia, which cannot be reversed, okay? So our first generation antipsychotics, the goal there is that they block the dopamine. Um, they, they target those positive symptoms of schizophrenia. So a couple of examples would be Thorazine and Haldol. Um, again, they have that side effect of extrapyramidal symptoms. Um, caught early, we can intervene. Um, treatment for extrapyramidal symptoms are usually um, some uh, low-dose anti-Parkinsonian type drugs. So cogentin is a common one that's used and Benadryl has actually been effective. So if you remember in that video of acute dystonia where the man's mouth was um, he couldn't close his mouth, he didn't have any voluntary movement of the mouth and it was gaping open and he couldn't talk. Um, in that video they gave him a dose of Benadryl and within 15 minutes his symptoms started to resolve. So that, that is an example. Now late effects of um, extrapyramidal side effects, again the tardive dyskinesia which is irreversible. And if you see these symptoms occurring, you're going to want to stop the medication immediately and stop that progression of those symptoms, okay? Um, anticholinergic effects are also very common, and if you remember, that's the dry mouth um, and constipation problems, um, that uh, polydipsia, excuse me. Second generation antipsychotics, these were your atypical antipsychotics. Um, these are the medications that bl block both dopamine and serotonin. So it targets those positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. It's a better drug. This is most commonly what you're going to see your schizophrenic patients on are the second generation um, antipsychotics. It's better in the fact that um, it, you don't see usually the extra pyramidal um, symptoms or side effects when they're on these second generation drugs. So that's a good thing, but again, there are negatives. And the negative aspect um, to these drugs is the metabolic syndrome. That is the weight gain, the dyslipidemia, the glucose, the altered glucose metabolism, and the insulin resistance. So these patients are going to be at risk for long-term side effects um, such as diabetes, hypertension, arthrosclerotic heart disease, okay? Some common um, meds in this category are uh, clonazepine. And remember with clonazepine, this one is the one that causes um, the bone marrow uh, suppression. So we are going to be want, wanting to monitor white blood cell counts if the person is on that particular medication. Again, I'll point out Risperidol. Risperidol is the, of all these second generation medications, Risperidol is the one that is most likely going to cause the extra pyramidal symptoms. It also, um, as I mentioned in our first lecture, has that um, cardiac abnormality uh, 
a risk because of the prolonged QT interval. So our third generation antipsychotic, there's only one, and that is Abilify. And Abilify, what it tries to do is stabilize the dopamine system. How exactly it does that, I'm not certain, um, but it is a little bit different than the other antipsychotics. The other ones were having that blocking action. Um, the third generation has a, is somehow stabilizing the dopamine system. So again, it will help with the positive and the negative symptoms, but a bonus here is that it also helps with their cognitive disabilities. Um, it does not uh, have the risks like the first generation one with the extra pyramidal um, symptoms, side effects, and it also does not have the side effect of the metabolic syndrome. Um, it also doesn't have the anticholinergic effect. So, um, you know, this seems to be the superior antipsychotic medication. However, most commonly, I still do see the um, second generation medications being used. And maybe that's because there's not enough research yet on this Abilify. Um, not sure, but you're still going to more commonly see the second generation um, than this Abilify. <coughs> Excuse me. So, three potentially dangerous things that I want you to know about antipsychotics. This anticholinergic effect on the body causes a, it can cause a toxicity. Okay, by blocking too much of the acetylcholine, remember that, um, it can have these anticholinergic effects, okay? And symptoms of this toxicity are going to be hyperthermia. So you're going to have high fevers, hot, dry, red skin, um, reduced bowel sounds, which will lead to this um, paralytic ileuses. You're going to have agitation, delirium, fluctuating vital signs, tachycardia, okay? Um, another key point is that their pupils will be dilated, and even with when you put light on it, it will not accommodate. They're, so the pupils continue to be dilated. That's a, that's a good clue. Um, confusion, mental status changes, worsening of their psychotic symptoms, and in the end, coma. So um, this is one condition that you need to be very, um, you know, aware of. The other is the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This is very rare, but if it does occur, it is life-threatening. This condition is most common with the first-generation antipsychotics. But it can occur with the second generation, but it's most common with the first. The, why does it happen? It's an excessive blocking of dopamine, okay? Too much blockage of the dopamine. Symptoms you're going to see with this, um, most telltale symptom is going to be muscle rigidity. Um, you might have labile hy hypertension or labile blood pressures, tachycardia again, tach uh, tachyrespirations, diaphoresis, they might be drooling. Um, so treatment with this is early detection, discontinue those medications immediately, manage their fluid balance, get that temperature down, and then we need to be monitoring for DVTs and rhabdomyolysis. So remember, rhabdomyolysis is that breakdown of muscle tissue. Um, which increases our CPK, CPK values and, and threatens the kidney functions. So you might see them drawing CPK levels to see if this is what's going on. The um, agro, agranulocytosis, remember that was with cl clonazepine only, so this would be one that you'd want to be aware of if your patient was on clonazepine, okay? That's that suppression of the bone marrow, which results um, in um, 
fluctuations in their white blood cell count and making them susceptible to infection. So again, we're going to be doing lab draws to mon monitor that white blood cell count. Other treatments, they're going to be in short-term psychotherapy, um, group therapy, family therapy, and we're you know trying to um, do the milieu therapy, which is providing them a safe, um, comfortable, open environment where they feel um, heard, they feel safe, they um, trust you, um, that you're there to help them. Uh, finally, community resources. <clears throat> so resident, residential crisis centers for patients that cannot stay out in the community. <coughs> Halfway houses where um, they can be supported, day treatment programs, mental health clinics, home health care, employment programs. So that you know they're going to help them get jobs and sustain jobs. Um, drop off centers, respite care for caregivers. Those are just some of the community resources. We've talked about others in the past. Um, such as NAMI and that um, assertive uh, community treatment program uh, in the psychiatric home health care. So that will end our um, lecture on schizophrenia. Thanks for attending. Ah, what happened? Escape.